So I'm going to give you a study. I don't really quote a lot of outside sources, but we need to hear those sometimes. In a study of 75 youths, and this was a study um, under the website of AmericaFirstPolicy.com, in a study of 75 youths in the justice system, 66% experienced fatherlessness, and 20% had never lived with their father. Another survey says 85% of youth in prison come from fatherless homes. 71% of high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. And this uh, comes from the website no longer fatherless.org. And not only is there a lack of fathers raising their kids, but the ones who, that do raise their kids are under the gun of the world's attacks against masculine men, especially godly men. Even if a child gets a father, the world wants that father to be weak. Therefore, there's a lack of strong fathers. And with this, most kids have either no father or a weak father, let alone most kids do not have a strong Christian father. That's where we live. That's what's going on here. God designed fathers to lead the household with strong discipline towards godliness. So we're going to see here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, as we've been continuing through our series of the marks of a godly leader, we are going to see a strong discipline. So these passages that we're in today, chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, give us three traits of a godly leader's strong discipline that will help you to be one and to follow one. So once again, 1 Thessalonians 2, chapters and verses 10 through 12 give three traits of a godly leader's strong discipline that will help you to be one, uh, be a godly leader, and to help you follow a godly leader. So we're going to read 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting at verse 10. You are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave towards you believers. Just as you know, we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So like I said, we are continuing in our series on the marks of a godly leader in this chapter, and Paul gives us 12 marks of a godly leader in four different categories. The first two categories, which covers six marks, covered a godly leader's pure motives. The second section the spirit-driven actions of a godly leader. Last time we covered the category of gentle love, including its three marks. And with that, Paul had used the metaphor of a mother and how she displays gentle love to her children in her leadership of them. And he is now showing the other side of that coin, the metaphor of a father. And we learned that the traits that we saw in a nursing mother are those that should also be embraced by a godly man who is leading. And we see that Paul and his guys, Timothy and Silas, demonstrated those things as a godly mother would do. So we're learning these traits. And Paul describes this necessary balance to the Corinthians, and he says this, 1 Corinthians 16, 13, and 14. He says this to the men, be on the alert. <laughs> That's just chew on that one for a minute. Be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men being strong. Let all that you be done be done in love. That's the contrast, but yet it's all part of the same package for a godly leader. And with this, we see the reminder that God gave Joshua several times before engaging in his spiritual and physical battle you guys know this, uh, Deuteronomy 31, 78, or 7 and 8, 23, Joshua 1, 2 Samuel, we hear the same command, be strong and courageous. Strong means strong. Courageous means it's going to be scary, but you have to overcome your fear. 
Courageous doesn't mean that you're foolishly numb and not don't have any fear. No, courageous means you're able to say, that's really scary, but I got to do it anyway. That's what courage is. Be strong and courageous because you're going to go out there and it's going to be very intimidating. And so you need to be courageous and admit, this is really scary, but I'm supposed to do it anyway. And I'm commanded to be strong and a godly leader is equipped to be strong already. He just needs to do it. This is what we see. So we see then the three traits of a godly leader's strong discipline that will help you to be one and to follow one. First one here, a godly leader in verse 10, a godly leader bears a godly example. A godly leader bears a godly example. Verse 10, you were witnesses and so is God. How devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you believers. You were witnesses and so are God. Everybody saw us do this. We set this example. And the first example was devoutly. Devoutly means pleasing to God in a holy manner. And we see that as Moses saw this burning bush and he went over to check it out, and God even called him over there to check it out. But as he approached, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said this, Moses, Moses, and he says, here I am. (laughs) But he said this. He says, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. That is how a godly man or a godly leader is to approach his ministry devoutly of this is scary. This is holy. I need to be careful with what I'm doing here. That's how a godly leader approaches the godly ministry that God has for him devoutly in great fear and trembling. The second one, we see the words uprightly, and this means fairly with justice, treating people according to God's standards. And this has to do with the way you treat people and the quality of your character and thought, word, and deed. And this was commanded by God for his leaders. We see it as leaders in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 1.16. This was the command for the godly leaders. Hear the cases between your fellow countrymen and judge righteously between a man and his fellow countrymen or the alien who is with him. Judge rightly. Then we see the term blamelessly. Blamelessly means above reproach with no valid accusations from man, having a good reputation before all men. Blamelessly. This is the example. Paul said this. 1 Timothy 3, 7, about the elder and pastor qualifications, which all men are supposed to have. He must have a good reputation with those even outside the church. He must have a good reputation with those outside the church, not just inside the church. Verse 10, then he says this, and this, and this is how, is what he's saying, how we behaved towards you believers. We behaved devoutly, uprightly, And blamelessly, he set the example. And with this, their behavior opened up the door for the Thessalonians' attention and credibility. By their credibility, the Thessalonians saw and said, we need to pay attention to these guys because they're practicing what they preach. We need to pay attention to them. And we see the fruit of that because in chapter 1, it talks about that they became believers. And, and it, it appears is the context that Paul is saying that they were all believers. And so these guys, like I said, practiced what they preached. And Paul uses, and the Bible uses, as we talked about, the metaphor of a mother, how she leads her children in gentle love. Paul uses a, another father metaphor relating to the Corinthians here. In 1 Corinthians 4.15, For in Christ Jesus I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I I exhort you to be imitators of me. So I became your father. I was setting an example, and you guys need to follow my example. And then, of course, you know how that goes, and so on, and so on, and so on. And so what we see then is this is what a godly leader does. He leads in front by example rather than in the rear with a whip. 
Let's go over that again. A godly leader leads by example in the front and says, come on, this is going to be hard. I need to be strong and I need to be courageous. And so do you guys, let's move. Instead of saying, you guys go get them and do what you're supposed to be doing and then whipping them from behind. That's not a godly leader. A godly leader bears godly example. He also bears godly teaching. Verse 11. Just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as, as a father would his own children. We were doing the same thing. We were taking on a fatherly role in exhorting, encouraging, and imploring as a father would. Compared to verse 7, we're like a mother would, a nursing mother. As a mother exhibits gentle love, a father is known as practicing strong discipline. And with this, he practices exhorting, encouraging, and imploring. And so his teaching then involves first the term exhorting, and it means to strongly call to one side. To strongly say, you need to go along with this. You need to buy into this. You need this. And this term is also used in explaining what preaching is to appeal like you guys got to get this you got to get this that's what preaching is paul uses the same term here in the english it says urge in this passage but in titus 6 he says likewise urge and we know that it's the same term in greek it means exhort likewise exhort the young men to be self-controlled it's like guys you got to be self-controlled it's it's you got to buy into this you got to do this that's exhortation. The leader's job is to exhort his flock to read and study the Bible, to make God a priority, to kill sin, and to identify and use his spiritual gifts and practice one another's and move on. That's what a godly leader's job is to exhort his flock to do. His teaching also involves encouraging. Encouraging. How about that? Yeah, it's part of it. To cheer up, console, inspire, to motivate, and even to coach. This is used to describe the tender and kind way of uplifting somebody that's struggling or hurting. It's as a coach. Come on, we can do this, you can do this, let's do this. Encouraging them. Encouraging, not discouraging. Encouraging. Paul uses the same term in the context later when he says this in 1 Thessalonians 5.14, later in the book, He's talking about doing the same thing here. That Christians are in the church are to admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, and help the weak and be patient with everyone. But to encourage the faint-hearted, the ones that I can't make it, I can't go through that. I'm having a really hard time to encourage them. The godly leaders practiced then, we're talking about Paul, Timothy, and Silas, and practice exhorting, encouraging. And we see that they also practiced imploring. Imploring means to urge of great importance. It's the charge, and get this part, even the serious warning of judgment, therefore even practicing spiritual discipline. It's hitting it hard. And we see this then, this is teaching the message which God taught us in Deuteronomy chapter 27 and 28, that there will be blessings for obedience and there will be curses for disobedience. Imploring means, I'm just here to tell you that you've got to follow this because if you don't, it's going to hurt. The Father is commanded by God to hit this hard. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7, the Father is commanded to make sure that their kids understand these things. They're commanded to make sure their kids understand these things. A pastor is commanded to make sure everybody understands these things. The husband, too. And with this, it starts out, like we said, Proverbs 1, 7. With this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. If you don't have the fear of the Lord, you're not going to, how could you teach it? How could you live it? How could you implore? You got, you got to get your people like, hey, if you don't fear the Lord, you're in big trouble. And, and we can't help you. You can't even move on until you get that part right. 
And that's what a leader needs to tell the people. If you don't get this part right, you're in big trouble and there's no hope and it's going to hurt really bad. And so this then is the command for the leader to preach the Bible even if it's not popular. <laughs> and the leader is the father and the husband who is also supposed to lead by example and preach the Bible to his family. Matthew 28, 19 and 20 tells us this in 2 Timothy 4, 2. And with this is the command for his flock to listen and obey. Mark 1, 15, Jesus commands upon the preaching is the command to repent and believe. It's not even optional. So it's the responsibility of the leader to preach, even if it's uncomfortable. And it's the, it's the job of the flock to listen and obey. And since sin is eternally deadly, sometimes harshness is necessary in what James or Jude talks about in Jude 23, snatching someone out of the fire. We talked about that when we were in Jude. Snatching is a word that involves violence. It means they're, getting, they're in the fire and they're going to be mad, but I'm going to snatch them out because they're on fire and they don't even know it. And I'm, they're gonna, we're going to throw them on the ground, we're going to roll them around, and we're going to smack them until the fire goes out, and it's going to hurt bad, but it needs to be done. And this is painful. The wisest man who ever lived, King Solomon commanded, remember the one that wrote the uh, beginning of Proverbs? The wisest man who ever lived, as I said in my prayer, because he prayed for godly wisdom first. He sought after God and his kingdom and his righteousness first and asked for wisdom to lead Israel to be a leader, and he did. And he got the most wisdom of any man that ever lived. King Solomon commanded the rod to be used in disciplining children several times. In disciplining children, four times. In the total of disciplining fools and children, eight times in the book of Proverbs. The same message. Why does he keep having to say it over and over and over? His father, King David, spoke of the value of the rod. This is the rod of discipline we're talking about. And the rod isn't necessarily a tool, but it is a way of dealing something painful for someone who's stubborn. And Proverbs 13, 24 says this. Let me back up. Uh, this is what King David said about the rod in Psalm 23, 4, which we all know is a really nice Psalm 23, and it's usually at funerals. And, but this is what he says. This is what David says about his shepherd. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. King David also said this in Psalm 119.71. It was, listen to this, it was good for me that I was afflicted that I may learn your statutes. This is the king saying it was good that I was afflicted that I may learn your statutes. We see this then in Psalm in Proverbs 13, 24, and one of those from Solomon. He who withholds his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. With this term withholds, it says here the rod is not to be withheld, meaning withheld means something prescribed by God as righteous in the same way that you are not supposed to withhold money you owe somebody. It's the same word used in that context is that you're supposed to do this, and so don't withhold doing what you're supposed to be doing. You owe somebody money, you pay it. If you're in charge of a, of a flock and there needs to be discipline, you are not to withhold that. That's the command. And, <laughs> chew on this for a minute, People actually want the rod of discipline. We saw that David saw what it did for him after the fact. But people actually want the rod, even if they've never even experienced it. They want the rod of uh, discipline. They want their boundaries, and they want someone to care about them. And the rod gives them this love. Now, it sounds crazy, but I dealt with this as a police officer. You don't know how many juvenile delinquents were antagonizing the police to get smacked 
so that they would feel love and that at least somebody cared about them and that somebody would show them the boundaries and they would actually instigate things for that reason. It doesn't make any sense, but they craved that discipline, which was a sign of love. And it was a sign of boundaries of somebody like actually leading me in what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm all the way over here because nobody was helping me with this. It's amazing the things that we dealt with seeing these things. It happened all the time. We see this then. Jesus then gives us the example of these things that start out gently, but they, they may have to escalate the harshness. For the good of the person and the good of the flock, he then describes this in Matthew 18, the process of dealing with sin in his beloved church as starting with gentleness that may have to lead in harshness and removing somebody from the church due to their stubbornness. And this is what Jesus teaches. And listen to what else Jesus teaches. Speaking of harshness, as a last resort against sin, remember, sin is that eternal deadly thing. As a last resort against sin, Jesus made this shocking statement. If your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out, and throw it from you, for it is better to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Matthew 5.29 and 18.8. That's harsh. That's Jesus who is God himself, his attitude about the responsibility of killing sin and therefore the responsibility of the leader who's over all this. The leader has to be strong and courageous because it's really hard. Therefore, with this, the rod is not, you've got to get this part, the rod is not to appease the leader's anger or to even make the child angry but it's for the good of the child. So let me repeat that. The rod is not to appease the leader's anger or to make the child mad. It's for the good of the child. And it should be something that the leader says, man, why are you making me do this? I don't want to go to this point. And God is saying, but you need to be strong and courageous. Of course you don't want to because a loving leader does not want to do that. Paul says this. We saw this in, six, in Ephesians 6, 4 last year. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, we all know <laughs> that the discipline and instruction of the Lord makes people angry. So it says, do not make them anger, angry with your sin. If they get angry because you're giving them the word of the, of the Lord and discipline that goes along with that, and they're angry, that's their problem. But don't you make them angry for your selfish and prideful reasons. We see this with Jesus, though. He's known as the lion and the lamb who started out as a gentle lamb at his first coming. What's going to happen in the second coming? The gentle lamb? He did that already. And then he gave over 2,000 years of, guys, I'm trying to be easy on you. I'm giving you, I'm giving you, I'm giving you, I'm giving you all this, these opportunities here. And yet, when he comes back, he will be the brutal lion at his second coming the brutal lion of Judah, with all this time of patience, but it's going to come to that. Then we see Jesus, God himself, giving the sad consequences of God's final step of discipline for the rebellious adult children in Israel. In Deuteronomy 21, 20 through 22, it is commanded that the leaders, the fathers, then take the kid out who's an adult, a child now who refuses to conform and then he's supposed to be stoned to death and hung up on a tree. That's God's end of his uh, harshness. That's the limit that he puts on that, which is terrifying. It should be terrifying to everybody in this room. This is how God views this, though. Verse 11, then. Just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you. <coughs> Get this part. Again, as a father would his own children. As a father would with his own children. And with this, Paul had considered Timothy his spiritual son. Paul considered himself to be a spiritual father over Timothy. And therefore, he poured in to Timothy. 
He considered him a spiritual son, and he poured into him. He recognized him as an assignment by God to father him spiritually. In the same way that every man in this room and every woman in this room has a specific assignment of leadership that God has given you for your own flock or your own person. This was in 1 Timothy 1 and 1 Timothy, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy 1, 2, and then also throughout 2 Timothy. John speaks of those he is writing to. 1 John 2, 1 is my little children. John, who wrote Revelation with all these scary things that was going to happen when the lion came, is still three books before Revelation was saying, my little children. This is what we have here in a leader's view of his job. A father then disciplines those he recognizes at his, as his own. It's his own children, it says. Therefore, what we said, his God-given stewardship along with his personal affection for them. Not only is your flock or this person assigned to you, but that you should want what's best for them out of personal affection for them, as we talked about, that the gentle mother has. A personal affection for her children, wanting what's best for them, and having this fondness for them. God uses the same example of us being his own children as him being our Father who is in heaven. Sound familiar? You hear that in the Lord slash, but it really is the disciples' prayer. The author of Hebrews says this then about this, of our own father's uh, love and discipline. Hebrews, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and he scourges every son he receives. Even the good ones? Whoa, who are the good ones? Romans 3.10 tells us who they are. There ain't any. <laughs> There are no one good. Every single person needs to be disciplined at some level is what God is saying. He scourges every son who he, whom he receives. And it says here, it is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. If you're not disciplined, you're not a real son. But if you are a son, you will be disciplined. If you are a father, you shall discipline your children, your flock, to the extent that's necessary. Keeping in mind, as we keep meaning to remember, the example of the nursing mother and the whole message that Paul gave us on that. Keeping in mind, keeping in mind, keeping in mind, it has to be with that starting point. Verse 9. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our own good, so that we may share in his holiness. Verse 11. All discipline, and this is, by the way, in chapter 12 of Hebrews, Verse 11, all discipline for the moment seems to not be joyful, but sorrowful. Does that sound familiar? Yet, to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields peaceful fruit of righteousness. Those who have been disciplined don't like it, but afterwards are so grateful for it. David was glad when he was afflicted. I am glad that I was afflicted. Paul relates the same sphere of discipline for shepherds in the church. He says this in 1 Corinthians 5, 12, and 13. He says, well, what do I have to do with judging outsiders? They're, they're outside the church. They're not part of my flock. What do I have to do with judging outsiders? They're not my responsibility. They're not my assignment. I'm not going to go out and chase all these people down and be the moral police. But then he says this, do you... Basically, but do you not judge those who are within the church? Those outside the church, God judges. But don't you judge the ones that are in the church? That's what you're supposed to be doing. 
A father does not discipline other people's children, only his own. It's not your job as a father to go around and get in everybody else's family and all these other things. It's supposed to be going on in the church. Now, we know within the church we practice the one another's and we help each other with those things. But going outside the church and going and being, like I said, being the moral police out over here and all over there, that's not our job. But as, as brothers in Christ, we are going to encourage each other to do this, do a good job with this. And as sisters in Christ, with this, <clears throat> you have heard the phrase, wait till your father gets home. <laughs> Everybody's pretty much heard that. Just You just wait till your father gets home. This then speaks of overall strong godly discipline for the sake of love. So overall, exhorting, encouraging, and imploring means this in a nutshell. This is what it means in a nutshell. You need to do this. I will help you. And if you don't do this, it's going to hurt really bad. Let's go over this again. This is what exhortation is. is you need to do this. Encouragement is, and I'll help you. Imploring is, if you don't do it, it's going to hurt really bad. Those are the three things that show what we're looking at here in godly teaching. A godly leader then bears strong discipline, and he also bears a godly goal. A godly goal. Who, whose goal is a godly goal? Oh, it's not his. Verse 12, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of God, of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. A father leads his children to a purposeful goal, and he desires to see them succeed. That's what a good father does. And with this, <clears throat> a godly goal, not to make the father look good, not to make the father feel proud, not to be the father's buddy or playmate, but that the child would grow up and meet the godly goal. The world defines goals as sports, college, career, and even marriage, and none of those are bad. But that's not the godly goal for a leader. Those things aren't bad, but they can't be viewed as the goal. And with this, their goal, pay attention, this part's a big one. With this, their goal is not to follow all the rules. Wait a second, did I just say that? Their goal for your children isn't that they would follow all the rules but to have the right attitude towards God. Otherwise, they become religious Pharisees, hypocrites, who just go along and fake it till they make it. That's not your goal. Oh, look at my son. He's just follows all the rules of this, that, and the other. And look, I've got him whipped in the shape on all these things, every dot and tittle. He doesn't swallow any gnats. He takes care of all these things. But like Jesus said, that of the Pharisees, and you guys are going straight to hell because you hate God. You did all this so-called nifty stuff. That's not our job as fathers. Our job is to adjust their attitude towards God. And then all those other things will come. And they're not going to come as perfect as we want them to come. But that's our job. And therefore, this then is the godly goal. We see here that you walk in a manner worthy of the God who called you. And so Paul describes this worthy manner in Ephesians chapter 4, 1 through 3. Therefore, I, speaking of himself, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you, oh, here we go, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling by which you have been called with all humility and gentleness with patience, showing tolerance for one another, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. With this, your goal for them is their salvation, their sanctification, and then to teach others who will then teach others, and so on, and so on, and so on, 2 Timothy 2, 2, which is then the Great Commission. Your goal is to raise up children that will be saved, sanctified, and do what they're supposed to be doing. And with this, with this, your children or anybody that you lead needs to understand your goal for them. And it's my job and any church leader's job to help people to see, like, this is the goal for you. Not to go out and follow all these rules and look really cool 
and look really pious. That's not the goal. Now, these are, those things would then be, could be fruit of your heart change. That's great. But if you go do that first, you're not handling first things first. You got to deal with their souls, not their actions. It's their attitude that you need to work on. And we see here then, verse 12, God, the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And this means into his splendor and radiance with all the attributes, attributes and blessings is your goal is to cause your people that you're leading to want to walk close to God and, and enjoy all of God's attributes and blessings is what your goal should be. Not just the future kingdom, but the kingdom now in the presence of the watching world. See, the kingdom here now, very small, but people are watching to the watching world. Where the world then sees Christians de displaying God's glory and demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit. You want your children to have the right attitude, that they would be saved, and that, they, and that you would do everything you can to save them. Now, we know theology uh, tells us that we cannot do everything, but that's our goal for our children. That we would then, that our children would then walk uh, and, and display the fruit of the Spirit to the watching world, which is uh, Galatians 5:22: love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. <laughs> and all of these things, the world cannot comprehend. They don't get any of it. But when we display those things, it causes some people who God has touched to say. I, I want some of that. Where is that coming from? How is that? That doesn't make sense, but none of my friends think that makes sense, but I, I, I'm interested in what, well, and that's God's tugging at their heart. We're supposed to be out there to catch those people that are that God has touched. We're supposed to be the ones that he, that, that walk in front of these people and all of a sudden he says, after he's touched their hearts, that I want to be, that. I need that. And that's what your children need. That's what the people in your flock need. Therefore, the goal then is that they would grow up to be mature Christians. And with this, a godly leader bears a godly goal. So we saw these three traits of a godly leader's strong discipline that should help you to be one and to appreciate one. We see the godly example, devoutly pleasing to God, uprightly, fairly, with justice, treating people according to God's standards. Blamelessly, that means above reproach, with no valid accusations from the man, but having a, or from any man, but having a good reputation before men. Also, a godly uh, leader bears godly teaching and exhorting by teaching them the Bible, encouraging them by motivating them along, even when it's hard, and to imploring them at any cost to heed the warnings and the blessings through obedience and the curses of disobedience. And a godly leader then, like we said, bears a godly goal to make disciples of Christ, teaching them to obey all that God has commanded them. So with this, getting full circle back to where we started. The world hates the term authority, especially men in authority. The world hates the idea of masculine men. The world says that children can make their own decisions, yet with some guidance from a strong and independent woman. But not, we, none of that man stuff. That's what the world wants. The man has been left out of this process as a threat to freedom and independence. That's what the world does, is get the man out of the picture because they are a threat to freedom and independence. But contrary to what the world says, children and people in general need leadership that will accurately point them to Christ. Everybody needs that. Godly leadership involves the traits seen between in mothers and fathers. Godly men need to uh, emulate what a nursing mother does in gentle love. And the flock needs both. The gentle love as a mother and the strong discipline as of a father. That was God's design. And therefore, the question comes about then, okay, okay, okay. Why such a need for such seriousness and even harshness in exercising this whole use of force thing? Why do we have to harp on this? But... The flock need to understand these things because godly leaders have a heavy responsibility to do their job. The flock needs to, the, the leader 
and the flock need to understand that the leader has a heavy responsibility to do this. Let's look at what God says to Ezekiel in chapter 3. Verse 17, Son of man, I have appointed you a watchman to the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, warn them from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you do not warn him or speak out to warn the wicked from his wicked ways, that he may live, that that wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood, let me back up, his blood I require at your hand if you do not warn him. I demand your blood for his sin. Verse 19, yet if you have warned him, the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered yourself. Verse 20, again, when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I place an obstacle in front of him and he dies since you have not warned him, he shall die in his sin, yes, and his righteousness uh, that he's already done before that aren't, aren't going to help him, aren't going to cover it up. But his blood I will require of your hand. However, if you have warned the righteous man that, right, that the righteous should not sin and he does not sin, he shall surely live because he took the warning and you have delivered yourself. Therefore, a godly leader slash watchman is held accountable to, by God to manage his flock, dealing with sin to the extent necessary. Otherwise, he will be guilty before a holy God. The opposite then is seen between or with the false leaders that just cover up the sin and they say, can't we just all get along and we don't even want to talk about it. They claim that peace is really only necessary between people and that God's okay with it as long as we all get along. But this is what God says about that. Jeremiah 6, 14 and throughout the Old Testament. This is what he says about these false teachers, false prophets, false leaders. They've healed the brokenness of my people superficially, saying, peace, peace. But there is no peace. They're covering it up. Oh, it's okay. They're not warning it. They're just saying, oh, there's peace. Everything's okay. And God is saying, when there is no peace, woe to them. They're covering it up. They're afraid to do what they're supposed to be doing. And with this, false teachers and false leaders and false prophets will just give people a false sense of security and comfort them on their way to hell. That's what God says about this. With this, then, a godly leader will deal with any sin at any cost to himself and even the so-called peace among people in order to answer God who has appointed him the position of watchman. And a godly leader will even have to rock the boat if that's necessary. This is what we got, guys. Can you see why we need to be strong and courageous? And I'm talking about everybody in this room. Like I said, everybody in this room is in some position of leadership. The sins of his flock will be on his head if he doesn't manage sin. So he has the choice of being a people pleaser or a God pleaser. So all, overall, we see this then that uh, this whole passage from verse 1 to 12 talks about how to be a godly leader and how to follow one. And once again, uh, a godly leader bears godly priority. He bears godly integrity, humility, produce, which is the fruit. Persecution he puts up with, truth, gentle love, affectionate love, sacrificial love, and it gives a good example, and all teaching, all with a godly goal. So I want to give you some closing thoughts that I hope rattle you. For the leaders, and like I said, everyone in this room is some kind of a leader. How do you think... In Deuteronomy 21, how do you think the ungodly father feels about himself as he walks his son through town to be stoned for his rebellion in the presence of God and everyone? And everybody, God and everybody knows that he failed to provide strong discipline. How do you think he feels? Just chew on that for a minute. Or, that's the ungodly father. How do you think the godly father feels about going down the same path with his rebellious son, yet 
with everyone knowing, meaning God and everyone knowing, he practiced strong discipline doing all he could. Think about how he feels. Two different feelings, right? One of them is, I, I chose not to be a godly leader, and the other one is, I did the best that I can. They're both miserable situations, but think about it. What about the mother who, think about how she would feel, the mother who undermined her godly husband's godly attempts in strong discipline. How would she feel as the husband is saying, okay, the time is up. We are now taking him to his death, to be stoned to death and hung on a tree. How does the godly mother feel who undermined her husband in doing what he's supposed to be doing? Hopefully it, it's upsetting, because it is upsetting. Then how about this for the followers, which is everybody in this room. We are all some kind of a follower behind godly leadership. All of us are. So get back to the prison. We talked about the men in prison earlier. How do you think the man in prison feels who wished he had a father who practiced strong discipline but didn't? How does he feel sitting in prison, knowing, having his whole life every single day for maybe the rest of his life about what a failure he was and what a sinner he was and how he wished that he had a godly leader that, with strong discipline so he wouldn't be in the situation he's in? How do you think he feels? How about this? How do you think the man in prison feels who had a father who practiced strong discipline yet rejected it? How does he feel? And you can already come up with answers for these questions I've given you. Everybody has an answer, and they're painful. The, fa the, the man who's in prison who had a father who practiced strong discipline, yet he rejected it, and there he is sitting there. How does he feel? Now, this is the thing you need to also grasp. The good news. No one in this room is in the horrible and unescapable circumstances of prison like these men are right now. Nobody in this room is in their situation. You're all free to go. Everybody here can walk out of here and not be forced to think about these things like those guys do. But... How many of you are in the inescapable prison of sin being an ungodly leader or being an ungodly father? It's, it's, it's not unescapable, it's escapable. If you're an ungodly leader or an ungodly father, it's escapable. Just as easily as for you to get up and walk out the door right now, your sin that you're in bondage of, of being an ungodly leader and an ungodly follower, is still you can be free from it today. You are free to walk out of this room and you're free to repent from the bondage of your sin. It's free. Those guys have already crossed the line. They've done what they've done and they're sitting there and they're going to be thinking about it forever and it's free for everyone here. And with this, as we've gone over godly leadership, next time we'll see the godly response to godly leadership, which will help us to be godly followers. We've seen the 12 marks of a godly leader. Next week, we're going to see the marks of godly follower of godly leadership. Let's pray. Heavenly Father.